Hello, well, I'm joined today by Cameron Stewart, who is the Associate Editor of The Australian and a National Security Investigative Reporter. Welcome, Cameron. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And uh, I was only just brushing up on your bio. Of course, I've been a great admirer of your work, but I was un- unaware that you were, in fact, a uh, intelligence agent before you joined <laughs> The Australian. Was that much help in, in your work? No, it wasn't really, to be honest. In fact, it was actually more of a hindrance. I worked for two years for the Defence Signals Directorate, which is now called the ASD, and then I uh, moved to journalism from there. It was a very long time ago. I guess it gave me a bit of an interest in national security and defence issues, but um, to be honest, it was a bit accidental. Yeah, and we seem to only miss each other by one year at the Australian, I can see from your bio, so that was a shame I didn't get to work with you there. Yeah, you should have hung around longer. (laughs) Well, look... We're looking at anti-terror laws, and it seems that they impact on journalists in ways like giving agencies extra surveillance powers, uh, restrictions on people talking to the media, particularly terror suspects or those under control orders, um, new powers for magistrates and judges to close court proceedings, and a limit on access to certain places or on certain occasions that might have some terrorism implications. So I'm just wondering the extent to which you as a reporter are conscious of these sorts of laws and how they impinge upon your work. Um, look, it's a good question because the game really has changed since 9-11 um, as far as national security reporting because quite clearly uh, newspapers and other media have a much greater demand for reports on national security issues because terrorism became more of a, um, you know, a, a front of front of mind issue for all the media and all Australians, of course. Um, and so there was a great growth in terror laws, uh, and honestly, it's it's impossible virtually to keep up with with all of them. Um, so I guess from my point of view, and I think probably from most reporters' point of view, they tend to try and just keep up with the issues that affect them as they try and report these issues. Uh, and in that in that respect, there really has been um, a, a lot of change and quite a difficult um, process, I think, for reporters now to report on these issues. I mean, it's a very fraught area to report on because uh, it's quite easy to find yourself um, being investigated for sources uh, either with your knowledge or without your knowledge. And I've had uh, both those instances happen to me. Mm. Well, maybe you could talk us through a couple of examples of how you've been conscious of this happening in your work and it might have actually affected it. Um, well, I mean, with obviously with every story, you're, you're very aware of, uh, of, of source issues. Um, what I've found has changed uh, has been the, um, the keenness of authorities. Uh, and when I talk authorities, I'm talking um, police, uh, uh, federal police, uh, state police, also police watchdogs, but more than just police, also the bureaucracy in Canberra. Uh, I do a lot of defence reporting on national security, and the Defence Department is very quick to uh, to send their security authorities in to look for sources. And so what i found is that um, when I've had certain stories, uh, and you get a bit of a sense of what those stories are, I hear through channels that they've, they've launched an investigation, or else sometimes, in the case of a story, I got a leaked copy of the Defence White Paper in late 2012, uh, the government was quite open. They said, we'll have an AFP investigation into the source of that leak. And uh, a better known one to a lot of people was in 2009 when I wrote a story on Operation Neath, which was a counter-terrorism operation about um, a plan to attack the whole Soviet army base. Um, I was not only investigated, but I was subpoenaed as well. And there was a great um, three-year saga involving that. So um, from my point of view, I've been involved at the pointy end a few times. And it's it's there's a lot of issues as to how you try and protect your sources and how you have to behave differently these days um, to do that. Mm. Well, I talk with the students, uh, you know, about the, the, you know, the days of Watergate where uh, you might have had Bernstein and Woodward sit on a park bench and uh, have someone sit next to them and leave them some documents. But these days there are so many surveillance opportunities for authorities, you know, um, CCTV and uh, the geo-navigational mechanisms on our, on our phones and other devices. Is it even possible today to keep a uh, national security source confidential? It is a lot harder than it used to be. And in fact, ironically, it's a great example you have with um, Woodward and Bernstein, is that in fact that's actually still the best way to get your information. So here we go, we've done the full loop, the whole technological revolution, and the best way to get your information is just to have to meet someone in a park 
park, I think, uh, in the basement of a car park, they met Deep Throat. Um, and, uh, and you know, you, you, you swap things, you swap information in that way. Now, that's the way that you really have to do it, doing national security reporting these days. I mean, you can't, the thing that I've got to my ear now is your biggest enemy in every single sense. Um, you know, as the Snowden revelations have shown, uh, but we knew that anyway, uh, you know, the, the ability of, of authorities to, to track movements of journalists is really um, a, a great concern, I think, as far as protecting sources go. And the bottom line is that they can, what they do now, there's an there's a tr- increasing trend um, from grabbing the journalists and subpoenaing them and throw them in, throwing them in court, is what happened to me in 2009. I think the unfortunate outcome of all of that um, has helped persuade authorities that that's not necessarily a smart way to do things. Um, I think that what they're tending to do now, which is really difficult, especially for young journalists who are starting out, is that if you do get a good story on national security that they are pissed off about and want to um, to look at your sources, what they're doing is they're just quietly authorising metadata searches and things like that. So what that does is that gives them every phone call you've made. Uh, and I think they can piece together through an iPhone, for example, precisely what your movements are over a certain period of time. I mean, you know, you don't have to be rocket. It's not rocket science to work out who you might have been speaking to and uh, who sources might be. So really, when it comes to national security reporting on, on issues that might be investigated, and please remember that only a very small percentage are ever investigated. Uh, but nevertheless, at the pointy end, they are. Um, you really can't have what I've got to my ear anywhere near you, um, and you can't be arranging meetings on it, and you can't be using email, and it, it really it, take, it takes you back to the Stone Age. Hmm. So quite consciously, you would, for example, leave your uh, mobile phone back in your office when you are going out to meet a source. That's right. That's right. If, if I if I feel that that source is, or we're discussing an issue that that could be of enough a magnitude that could lead to a story that could you know etc cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, obviously my normal day when my phone is with me, um, so it's only on, on, on rare occasions. But absolutely now these days, if there is if, if I feel that situation is coming, there is no electronic um, stuff near me or around me. It's just the only way to do it. And, and you see, if you, obviously um, you would just have to do that because otherwise. Understandably, you, your sources you know, are just as nervous as well. Hmm. And I'd imagine they'd be very nervous in in this environment, given given those sorts of techniques. And when you're working with um, agencies, uh, you would imagine they would be well across the possibilities for people detecting them. So they'd be even more nervous in the national security context. That, that's right. That's right. And there's almost some things you don't you don't want them to say because you know you, you just. Yeah, it's, it's it's difficult. It's very it's very difficult. It's a delicate dance, really. Um, but I think that your point is is very valid. The the technological sort of revolution, if you like, I mean, um, has really made it harder for journalists to protect their sources in this area. And the thing is that um, you're always at the whim of, of politics, and politics is your biggest enemy with national security because um, there there is a a habit for for governments um, of all persuasions to. Uh, to investigate certain national security stories which they find embarrassing. And uh, national security is often described, uh, is, is often, it's often said that a certain story has a, is being investigated for national security reasons, when in fact it's being investigated for political embarrassment reasons. And there is a lot of national security stories that are investigated, in my opinion, um, to cover for embarrassment rather than genuine national security, because I think most journalists in Australia who report in this field are not reckless and are not seeking to cause any actual harm to you know to those things. Mm. So really, we've seen over that same period as those laws developing, we've also seen much more sophistication by governments in their media relations or, or spin management. Absolutely, I mean, there's a massive one of the biggest battalions in the defence force is the media relations team. Mm. You know, it's uh, it, it's grown exponentially, uh, and that comes from political conservatism too. You know, uh, and so what happens is that. In, on national security questions, uh, unless you've got good relation, personal relations with people in those bureaucracies, um, you ask a question and it goes through literally 30 eyes before you get the answer. So the answer you get is vanilla. It means nothing. And so you actually have to go through your own sources and be a lot more robust. Um, and, of course, they don't like that. And, and you know, So you get this antagonistic relationship that just naturally builds up. Mm. 
I guess if push comes to shove and there is a court case and, and you do actually have a confidential source, uh, which has happened to several journalists in, in recent years in Australia, we do have those new uh, shield laws in some jurisdictions, uh, protecting to some extent, but I don't imagine there's going to be much protection in a major national security case uh, because the judges have some sort of discretion there as to which is the greater public interest. They do have some discretion there, which which is... Uh that's exactly right. And also a great concern is those, those um, shield laws are not evenly uh, applied. Uh, for example, in, in Victoria, my understanding is that the, um, the body that's replaced the discredited and disbanded OPI, uh, which is called IBAC, um, there are no shield laws applicable to, um, to what they do with dragging journalists into star chambers and things like that. So you don't have a shield law in that respect. And even um, in my circumstance, when I was subpoenaed by the Office of Police Integrity back in 2009, um, there were aspects of that which I, I find quite disturbing and I know were applied to other journalists in Victoria as well. And that is that um, when you get the subpoena, there's a secrecy provision attached where you can't tell anybody, uh, including your own wife, um, well, you, the fact that you've been subpoenaed, you have to uh, be in a star chamber, you have to be you know, grilled and you could go to jail if you obviously you know, um, say no comment as, you, as you're required to do. So uh, really, uh, I think that that sort of, that sort of um, police watchdog is, is a concern to, to journalists. And it, it's not so much of a concern if it's applied sensibly, where the journalists are usually left out of it. But certainly in Victoria during the OPI Overland era, um, a, a bunch of journalists, including myself and a couple of other very good journalists from other newspapers, were subject to these terrible sort of provisions and hauled in front of star chambers uh, on a semi-regular basis. Now, that seems to have stopped now after all the silliness is over. But nevertheless, there's an example of what can happen, I think, in any state in Australia if police watchdogs um, get a bit of a swagger about them. They've certainly got the powers and there's really not much that journalists or the media can do to pre protect themselves and, you know, in lots of cases, protect their sources. And so, you, I mean, I, I've spoken with people in, um, in mental institutions who say that one of the basic uh, uh, criteria of paranoia is that people think spies or uh, government agents are following them. I guess in your line of work, um, that's a, a basic expectation that there, there is that possibility and also that things might be happening in secret that you should know about as a reporter, but you can't be told about them because people might be um, might be punished or jailed because they've told you that. Yes, that's right. I mean, so it is a, a, a yeah, it's, it's a it's a concern. And the thing you don't want to have as a journalist, of course, is is they is their um, approval to read your emails um, because not only is it relevant to the story, and this is one of the things that really annoyed me about the Operation Eve issue in two thousand nine, is I knew they were reading my emails, listening to my phone because that was all part of the warrant. Um, but what annoyed me the most about the emails and things like that is that you have a whole range of sources, a whole range of stories that are utterly unconnected with with that particular story, and you know you just you get worried about the protection of of those people or, or authorities sort of drawing links and things like that. So it's it's quite a, it's almost like a dragnet sort of thing that which can actually hurt journalists in lots of unintended ways. Yeah, what's the role of social media in all this? Uh, you, I guess you'd have to be very careful with what you say on Twitter or Facebook um, as a national security reporter. Yeah, I think you find that most of the stuff that, that uh, is tweeted by national security reporters is fairly, fairly sort of basic and, and banal, really. You know, uh, you obviously don't tweet that much about your stories, and obviously not before they go. Uh, but um, yeah, there isn't a great deal of, of conversation on, on Twitter and social media. You do have the power to write messages or direct messages there, but then also the authorities have the power to request these major multinationals um, like uh, like Google and, and Twitter to uh, give them access to, to those sorts of messages as well, don't they? Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, I think increasingly with electronic um, uh, communications, journalists have to play lots of games. They have to play lots of games about plausible deniability with sources and leaving gaps between um, the, the time they, they speak to them and making sure what they communicate with someone is fairly benign stuff. Um, you know, really sort of um, play games. So, man, in your head, if investigators were putting things together, they really couldn't make firm, concrete links. But, you know, even that's very hard. I mean, quite clearly, journalists are not more clever than the than uh, these sort of incredibly powerful, well-resourced, um, technologically advanced uh, agencies. So it's a, it's, it's a tough gig. All right. Well, look, look Cameron, that 
brings us to the end of the interview. Thank you very, very much for your time today. I hope this works with us both conducting the uh, the telephone conversation as well for, for technical reasons. But um, thanks for your time and good luck with your investigative reporting. Thanks. It's been a pleasure, Mark.